This is going to be part two of the overview of the book of Hebrews. And we know Hebrews, the theme is better things brought by the Lord Jesus Christ. Author Paul, most likely, 13 chapters, 303 verses, 6,913 words or around that many words. Doctrinally, we know the book of Acts uh, transfers us from the church back over to the Jews, just as the book of Acts transferred us transferred us from the Jews to the church. And devotionally, this book opens up the Old Testament stories and makes them plain for us. It's a reminder to us that Jesus is greater than everything and everybody. Historically, it was written around 35 AD, written to Hebrews who had received Jesus Christ but were in a struggle with staying free from ritualism. And the book shows us that it was written to show that Jesus is superior. And we made it to chapter 4 last time. So look at Hebrews chapter 4. And in this chapter we're going to see the superiority of the word of God and how Jesus is our great high priest. Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest... He also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The rest here doesn't have to do with me and you going to heaven when we die. It's about a millennial rest. And this is directed to the Hebrews of the tribulation, the tribulation period, who are not in the body of Christ, because in the body of Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. The rest is entered by laboring. See that? It says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. So the rest is entered by laboring. If you make this a rest that has to do with getting into heaven for me and you, uh, then you add works to our salvation, because it, this rest is entered by laboring. Look at Hebrews 4.12 now. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing the sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God is quick. That means it's alive. And it's sharp enough to pierce through anything, especially the one who pierced it. And in Isaiah 27.1, it says, In that day the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. You see, the word of God, Jesus is the living word. The Bible is the written word. Uh, the devil pierced the Lord, but his sword is much stronger than the one who pierced him. And he is going to pierce, he's going to punish the piercing serpent, Leviathan. It says in Isaiah 27, 1. So the word of God divides, it's a sword. And at salvation, he took the sword and he cut your soul loose from your flesh. That was a spiritual circumcision. And that's where you see that there where it says, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. So that's the spiritual circumcision. He took the sword. He cut your soul loose from your flesh. And now when you sin in the flesh, the sins don't apply the, to the soul anymore like they did before you got saved. They're no longer your soul and your flesh are no longer connected. They've been divorced. Uh, he cut you. And your soul is free to remarry and that will be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You see, if animals have night vision, if eagles can see so far away, if people have, have made telescopes and binoculars and they got all this technology to make you be able to see better, wouldn't you think that God can see much greater and much farther away naturally? You see, God can see anything and everything all the time. Everything is naked and opened into the eyes of him. 
you see these vans driving up the interstate with stolen kids in the back, it, it's all seen by the Lord. You see these things that are done in dark rooms and secret places and underground bunkers and hideouts. It's all seen by the Lord. He sees right down into the ground. Just because he doesn't punish them right away doesn't mean anybody's getting away with anything. Hebrews 4.14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Jesus Christ is my high priest. I don't need a Catholic priest. I've already got a priest. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Every way that you are tempted, Jesus was tempted. Read Matthew chapter 4 and see how the devil tempted him in the wilderness. I used to think he was only tempted after the 40 days of fasting in Matthew 4. But it seems as if he was tempted the whole 40 days and after. Because it says in Luke 4, 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. So it seems he was tempted the entire length of that time. But he went through every temptation undefeated. He is a superior high priest. He's superior to temptation. He is the word and the word is superior to anything and everything. Now chapter 5, he's got a superior priesthood. Hebrews 5.10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 5.12, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Jesus Christ is a superior Bible student. You know, when he was just a young one. He was in the temple and the, uh, had the doctors astonished at his knowledge. He's a superior priesthood. He's a superior Bible student. And here Paul is saying that certain people should, should be teachers. You see, the Lord was a teacher. He could teach anybody anything. And some people out there, some saints should be teachers and yet they need one teach them again. And not only teach them, but teach them the basic stuff. He said teach them, you know, the first principles of the oracles of God. You know, the things that they should have known a long time ago. He says they need milk like a baby and not meat like someone who's a full-grown Christian. Hebrews 5.13, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. This is where people get the saying, babe in Christ. Some Christians just never grow up. It says in Hebrews 5.14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice it says, by reason of use, because they have used the words of God. They have studied them, they've read them, meditated on them, memorized them. They've used it in their personal life. It has exercised their senses so that they have spiritual discernment. Now, chapter 6, Jesus is superior to the Antichrist in his mark. And he's able to keep you from falling. But there is a danger of falling away in the last days, in the tribulation. Hebrews 6, 1 through 2, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Continuing with the last thought, he says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. He says, not laying again the foundation. See, you done as if you... I have grown up and you're not a babe in Christ anymore. Somebody shouldn't have to go back and, and lay down the principles of the doctrine of Christ. 
They shouldn't have to go down and lay again the foundation. You already you should already have the foundations laid out, and you spend the rest of your Christian life learning and building upon the foundation. But there are some things that are foundations, foundational teachings. People call these the fundamentals sometimes. You know, the doctrine of Christ, the fact that Jesus is God. You should already know that Jesus is God if you've been saved a while. You need to have these things down in your mind so that no one can come and deceive you and so that no one has to come and teach you again. He said the doctrine of baptisms. You see, the Church of Christ says that there's only one. But here, it says baptisms, plural. It's true there is only one baptism that saves, that's why it says in Hebrews 4 that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, but there are other baptisms. There's one baptism that saves, but there's other baptisms in the Bible. For example, John said in Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You see, just in this one verse, you got three baptisms. The first one, you got John's baptism. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Then you got the Holy Ghost baptism, where he said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Then you got the baptism of fire, when he says, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And that one has to do with being cast into the lake of fire. Uh, Jesus is baptized with the baptism of death on the cross. It's called a baptism when Moses and Israel go through the Red Sea in 1 Corinthians 10, 2. You have Peter's baptism in Acts 2, 38, where Israel is getting baptized after they crucified their Messiah. And you have believer's baptism in Acts 10, where a man is baptized after he receives the Holy Ghost. See, so you got different baptisms. And there are, these are basic truths that the saints should know. And he says, let us go on unto perfection. Hebrews 6, 3 and 4. And this will we do if God permit. Now, he thinks you've gone on to, perf per per you've perfected some things. He thinks you've got the foundations laid. Now he's going to give some strong meat. And this is a hard chapter here. It's caused a lot of people to stumble it's caused a lot of people to think they can lose their salvation. It's caused a lot of people to think many different things about salvation. But if you realize that Hebrews 6 is doctrinally primarily for Jews in the tribulation, then you're going to come out a lot better. Look at Hebrews 6, 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. The first thing we're going to see is that this is talking about something that is impossible for someone to do. Because it says, for it is impossible. And the thing that is impossible for these certain people to do is to be renewed again into repentance. So it's going to be impossible for these people to be renewed again into repentance. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. You see, they were enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. This is someone who was a genuine saint at one point. So they were a genuine saint at one point. Now get it straight. It can't be someone today. It can't be me or you because we can't lose our salvation. It says they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. How can you be made a partaker of the Holy Ghost if you were never a genuine believer? at some point in your life. So it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. The world to come is the millennial kingdom. The powers are the powers that are associated with the kingdom. It says, If they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Shame. Notice it says, if they shall fall away. So it is impossible to renew someone again into repentance if they have fallen away. 
This can't be to us today because we can't lose our salvation for one thing. And if we fell away from the Lord for a time, we wouldn't lose our salvation. And we could just simply confess what we've done to the Lord and get right back in fellowship. What this is telling someone to do is that if they've fallen away, it's impossible for them to be renewed and again into repentance. And the only place that this will fit in the Bible is on those people who take the mark of the beast and worship the beast in the tribulation time period because they won't be able to be renewed again into repentance. You see, you can't put this on yourself in the doctrinal sense today. It can't apply to us. How could you apply it to me and you today? You can't. It says it's impossible for them to be renewed. So let's let's search this word in the scriptures, this word renewed. If it applies to us today, let's find out. Well, let's search it. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You see, though we do bad things in the outward, the outward man does bad things, our flesh, the inward man is renewed day by day. And that verse there in 2 Corinthians 4.16 is directly, doctrinally to a Christian today. You see, these verses in Hebrews 6 are talking about someone who has genuinely repented at one point and then fell away. Notice it says they can't be renewed again, showing they had already repented a first time. Or else, why would it say they can't be renewed again? Now, notice it also said they tasted of the heavenly gift. Someone said that this referring to someone who has tasted salvation, but they didn't swallow it. I don't think that works because in this same epistle that we're reading, it, it says the word tasted in another place. It says that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. Now, if tasted didn't mean completely gone, gone through with a thing, then Jesus really didn't die because it said Jesus tasted death for every man. Did Jesus not really go through with dying on the cross for our sins? Of course he did. So when it says tasted of the heavenly gift and tasted the good word of God, they literally received it. Jesus literally died on the cross, didn't he? Just like the person here in Hebrews 6 had really repented at one point. And notice if it did apply to us and you fell away and lost your salvation, then it would be impossible for you to get it back. But the great thing is we can't lose our salvation. I've heard the interpretation that the whole thing is a, hop, is a hypothetical situation. I've heard that as well. But I think the best fit for Hebrews 6 is for those in the tribulation who take the mark of the beast, it's impossible to renew them again into repentance. But you can't apply this to us today because there's no sin that you can commit that would make it impossible for you to get saved or cause you to lose your salvation and unable to get it back. There's no sin today. You can't lose your salvation, and there's no sin that would cause you to be uneligible to receive salvation.